Hello, algorithms and soulmates. I'm Al Reynolds, and this is my new YouTube channel and show, The Court of Public Opinion, the place where the people's voice can and will be heard. Now, if you're new to the courtroom, make sure you grab a seat and maybe a pencil and pad, but don't forget, you got to hit that like button if, you, to watch, if you're watching the show, hit that like button. Also, hit that subscribe button if you haven't subscribed already. Don't forget to share and add a comment because we love the engagements. Now, for all the newbies who've never been here before, don't be alarmed. Think of the court of public opinion as Nancy Grace meets Rapid Fire meets Fox Souls Face Off. Yes, this courtroom is going to be disruptive. It's going to be messy. It's going to be informative. You're going to hear us talk over each other, holler, scream, disagree, agree, laugh, make jokes, and even spill a little tea. So be sure to buckle up. Now, I'm your host and judge, Al Reynolds, and I have with me tonight the incredible Simone uh, Legal Beagles. I have my two incredible Legal Beagles tonight, Simone Redwine. Hello. Hey, Hi, Simone. Al. Welcome back. And the incredible criminal, criminal defense attorney, Brian Ross. Welcome back, Counselor. How are you feeling? Pretty good. How are you? <laughs> good, good. All right, everybody. So tonight we got an interesting lineup for you. We're going to talk about Jonathan Majors, how he got he gets one year on probation and he has to take a domestic violence intervention program. So the question here is, would you rather go to jail for 10 to 20 days or would you rather be on probation? for an entire 365 days. We're going to hear the advice from the legal beagles right here. And another question is, is his career over? I can't wait to hear what our legal correspondents have to say about this. Then we're going to move on and talk about Young Miami. And Young Miami gets served in uh, a Simone Redwine City, Houston, at a pool party where she was seen twerking right before the papers were served. Wow. So does this have anything to do with the sex worker allegations? We'll find out here tonight from our legal beagles. Then we're going to go to the baby. And he claims a fan has sexually assaulted him when she braised his penis while speaking to him on his private property in his car. So is a is a quick tap, Simone Redwine, is a quick tap really sexual assault? We're going to find out tonight. Then we're going to talk about Terrence Howard coming through with his 70s fair faucet flip, suing one of the largest management uh, companies in the world. Do you think it's a good idea to sue your agent? Where do you think the rest of your work is going to come from? Then we're going to cover a sad story where in sudden place prosecutor threatens custody of her mother's child because a cop shot her 11 year old son doing a domestic violence situation. So are they trying to make this about unfit motherhood instead of the fact that a cop shot a kid? We're going to hear from our legal beagles tonight. And of course, we'll round out the show asking our, our uh, individuals in the, in the chat and people that are viewing who we're going to call our jury members. We're going to allow our jury members to ask us any question that you have on your mind as it relates to these topics. Then last, we're going to do a ruling we're going to do a ruling right here in the court of public opinion, whether you would find them guilty or not guilty for everything that we're speaking about tonight. All right, everybody. So let's get started. All right. I want to start with Jonathan Majors. Mm -hmm. So I think this is this is a very interesting question to me because, you know, the, the, the judge made it very clear that he didn't think this warrant jail time. But then after he didn't give him jail time. He gave him 52 weeks. So we know that that's a year. He gave him a year of participating in a domestic violence intervention program, as well as community service and substance abuse. Attorney Brian, tell me, would you prefer jail time? Because some jail time could be like 10 days to 20 days or 30 days and he could get it out of the way. He doesn't have to worry about it getting into any of his you know, scheduling for any new films or, or movies that projects he may have going on. Or would you take prob probation in this case? This this question goes back to when you were a child and you did something bad and your mother said, do you want a spanking, a whooping, or do you want to be grounded for the weekend? Me, myself, I went in and took the whooping because I okay. knew it would hurt for a little while, but I got to go outside and play in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't change because you're an adult. Jonathan Majors 
took their probation. That's his personal choice. Maybe he's not a good good candidate. For, for, um, I mean, maybe his, his his lawyer thought he was a good candidate for, for probation, and mm-hmm. he threw some of these things. I've had many clients who are absolutely abominable people for probation. They will mess up. They won't even get out of the courthouse steps. <laughs> without some violating sort it. of paraphernalia in a car that doesn't belong to them. If I just say, go ahead and take the three days, bro. It's only three days. They're going to take you in at 2 o'clock. They're going to release you early at 6 a.m. You're going to be good. So yeah. I think in Jonathan Major's instance, his lawyer did a great job, first of all, and got uh, the best she could for her client and got in probation. Hopefully, he can stick to it. Simone Redmond, in your opinion, is his career over? Um, will this stain his ability to work with other big, you know, studios who who are 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 still maybe interested in him? Do you think that this would hamper any of his contract work and any? Oh of his no, black people, clauses? we can save him. I feel like black people will save him, just like we saved Vanessa Williams back when she had that little <laughs> lesbian love affair when she got her crown taken and we rallied behind her said, no, this is our black queen. I think between Tyler Perry and black America, I think he'll still be okay. But I also think a part of it is the fact that he didn't take a jail sentence. Because remember, he would have been at Rikers Island. The optics of 30 days at Rikers Island wouldn't be very good for his career versus him receiving something that's nonviolent, something like taking these domestic violence class, I think is going to look better. Plus, let's not forget, it appears they're still going to appeal the case. So I think that's also one of the reasons why probation is probably good here. They have not, the the time to appeal it, I don't believe has lapsed because he just did the motion for rehearing. That was declined. Now he can appeal. Now, this is my, this is my issue, uh, uh, counselors. Now, we know that when you are working, there is a moral clause. We discovered what a moral clause was in the contracts right here on this show. And that that's the reason why a lot of Diddy's contracts, including his Hulu's reality television show, was unraveled because of that moral clause. So my concern in watching this is if you put him on probation for a year, you extend him a contract with a moral clause. And what if he violates his domestic violence intervention program. That would give any studio the opportunity to exit his contract of his moral clause immediately. I would say for me, so that I can repair and not worry about it, I would take the time in jail so that people would not be looking over my shoulder in every contract that I get for the next 12 months. Am I wrong to think like that, Attorney Brian Ross? No, absolutely not. And remember, when you're on probation, you're subject to random drug testing. You're subject to random alcohol testing. They can show up to your house at 3 o'clock in the morning, knock on the door, and make you urine into a cup and test it right then and there. People try to time it, try to get into a rhythm. But when you're this high profile, there's no timing. There's no rhythm. So for a year, no drugs, no alcohol. And you also make yourself a target, right? Right. That's what I was thinking. Now you make yourself a person, you walk into a bar just to get a steak, you bump into someone, you're having a tough day, they're having a tough day, and it's blown out of proportion. Mm, good point, good point, Brian. I really like that. All right, we're going to move right on along. Young Miami and, and attorney Simone Redwine's city, Houston, got served. She got served papers at a pool party shortly after she was seen on video twerking. It was served by Charles Kenyatta, who, guess what, is in prison in the state of New York. All right, Attorney Redwine, tell us what is going on. And the question that I have, which I'm sure a lot of our our viewers and listeners have the same question, is what is exactly being served? And is this being served, did it have anything to do with the accusations by Rodney Jones, who said that she's a sex worker and was a part of the sex trafficking? Or is this something completely different? So this is completely different. This lawsuit is a copyright infringement lawsuit for the trademark and uh, implicitly trademark infringement for the trademark act that. So Mr. Charles Kenyatta Jr. has he applied for the trademark back in 2018 and received it in in 2023 while he was incarcerated. Now, he's been incarcerated in upstate New York for approximately three years is what he stated. And he's filed this pro se from behind bars. So if there are any trademark lawyers out there who want to get involved in a high profile case, they might want to jump on this one. So because if the facts are as he says, it sounds like he's got a good case, which is this. So he says 
back in around 2018, 2019-ish, um, some of Diddy's attorneys reached out to him on behalf of both Diddy and Carisha to do a licensing agreement to allow them to use the term act bad. Mm. She called one of her songs act bad. She also uses it on clothing and other things. Now he has the trademark act bad and uses it on clothing and so forth. And he also has just a company that called, he calls act bad. And so his allegation is they sent him the contract and they were in the midst of negotiations. They never came to an agreement, but they started using the mark anyway. And it mm -hmm. may have been that once he got incarcerated, they felt like, hmm, it's fine. We don't need to negotiate with you anymore and proceeded. And that's why I say, if in fact the facts are as we stated, and if there's evidence that you know contract negotiations started, but were not concluded, they not only will be on the hook for trademark infringement, so it's more likely trademark rather than copyright, but trademark mm -hmm. infringement, but also um, what's called, they could be eligible for trouble damages when you knowingly are using someone else's mark without them. Mm. Okay, so mm -hmm. Attorney Ross, tell me, why did uh, um, Charles Kenyatta have to serve papers? What's the difference between serving papers and just a general lawsuit? Or are they both the same? Do they run congruent? How does that work? No, no. You have to provide what's called personal service. So that person has to actually have notice of the lawsuit. The only There's many ways to do it, but the best way to do it is to literally put it in their hand. So while right. she's twerking at the pool party, she comes up from the twerk, gets handed papers. He says, you've been served. She says, okay, and walks off. She gives it to her lawyer. But the problem for young Miami is she finds herself in the hot seat again. You, right. Last week, you were involved in all this drama. If you listen to your lawyers, Brian Ross and Simone Redwine, you'd be maintaining a low profile, but instead you're at a pool party twerking. If you're in your house in your gated community, this becomes a lot harder to do. So mm. she's paying to this, the, the things that are happening around her and realize people, you're a target now. Everybody wants what you have. Lay low. Right. That, that that's actually very that's very very good because like if she wasn't out and about and it wasn't because the guy said clearly that he saw the flyer right yeah yep. so he said he's going to fly over to Houston and he's going to have her served and it actually worked he knew exactly where she was they were on live it was real time I said these 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 criminals are daggone telling the police where to find them. We got to do better than wow. that. We definitely got to do better than that. Okay. All right, uh, Simone Redwine. The baby claims a fan sexually assaulted him while she was trying to take a picture with him in his car. Now, his allegation is that as she was leaving her accident because he said, Auntie, I got to go, she just braised her hand over his penis. Show me how. Show me how she did it, Al. Show me. <laughs> well, you know, she just, you know, she just like snuck one in. I've had it happen plenty of times with me. They, they, they touch it to see if there's got any volume in it. So <laughs> is that Girl. seriously? Because I'm thinking, like, if that's the case, I could make a whole list of people that sexually assaulted me. Even when you go out, arms, hands rubbing across the yeah. couch in front. Absolutely. As well Even as in that Mister Rogers sweater. Right. And I, I personally have to say, listen, I'm concerned because you know how many booties I've touched out dancing and slap. I'm serious about this, Attorney Redwine. Can't is this considered sexual assault? Well, in this day and time, apparently, yes. And I like this for him from the perspective of it setting a tone, right? Because if you recall, um, it was Jamie Foxx was sued by a woman at a restaurant um, in the course of the last year who says that he groped her. He he put his hand up her dress, et cetera. Um, there was another incident where a woman accused one of the a football player of grabbing her butt somewhere and, and filed uh, charges against that. So he's setting the tone. He's saying, wait a minute. Next time somebody accuses me, I'm accusing you. I'm accusing you first because you ain't cheese and you know, part of it is the lady was probably ugly. And he's probably like, I don't want ugly people touching my Peter Weeder. Can you blame them? I wouldn't either. I think he may have had a different response if it was a younger person because he said auntie as in, hey, hey, this is off limits. I don't want your age range. I don't want your weight class, so to speak. Mm. But I think that, yes, there could be a claim here. I anticipate he's probably going to ask for something nominal and use it more so to set the stage 
so that people know this is not the environment where you can come over and accuse his entourage of anything. Or it could have also been the way she responded after he said something. If she became um, uh, uh, belligerent, he might have thought, you know what, just to protect myself, to prevent her from making an accusation, I'm going to go ahead and make an accusation of what happened first. So let me ask you this. So can she argue, though, couldn't she argue that, you know, she was just leaving. She wasn't really paying attention to where her hand was going. It kind of fell in yeah. his lap. And, you know, that she didn't intentionally mean to touch his penis. Like, could Absolutely. I mean, Okay. And I think that will be her argument. I don't anticipate this going far. If anything, it might go into small claims court in you know, some small town and get dismissed. Or it might be that he just wants her to give a written apology or something that he can use to say, hey, this is just my proof. I didn't do anything to this lady. She did something to me. So you mentioned something that was very crucial here for our listeners and viewers. You said that it could go into small claims court. Why did you say that? Because he would only be entitled to very minimal damages. He's fine. You and, and the way damages are calculated is if you're saying this has caused me emotional distress and stuff, you have to show that you are not able to uh, proceed with your daily activities. Right. He probably got on the plane, went to the next concert, went to the studio, got on live, did what he usually does. So for that reason, he would be entitled to hardly anything whatsoever. OK, so keep. I want to stay here for just one more second because mm -hmm. I have one more question. Let's talk about people who are sexually harassed by their boss at work, mm -hmm. but they continue to still come to work and do their job. Do they do they need to if they're being sexually harassed? What is the recommendation here as attorneys, Bross and Red Wine? Do they need to document it? Because Absolutely. if the argument could be made that if they were really sexually harassed, they couldn't go on with their day, them coming back to work every day doesn't really demonstrate that they were just emotionally distressed. Or Well, you I'm going back to work demonstrates you're poor. It demonstrates how much you needed this job. And if you had someone like myself or, or Brian Ross, we would say it demonstrates how desperate you were to work through this because you needed this job so badly. So if you tolerated it, it wasn't because you liked it. It was because you didn't have any options. Maybe you were tolerating it while you God. made your formal complaints and were looking for justice. So the first thing I would do is on the job, start writing emails to yourself immediately when this happens. Oh. Email yourself from your work email to your personal email. It's okay. going to be timestamped and you document exactly what happened. Then you're going to tell someone in HR in writing. If it's not in writing, it didn't happen. And then you want to draft what's called an EEOC complaint. So that is a free complaint process through the government that investigates the claim and um, can even step in in place of a lawyer to get you compensated. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you don't draft that EEOC complaint. You're usually done, right, Simone? Like, if you don't Correct. You file the EEOC, you're out. Right. In fact, you can draft the EEOC complaint before you go to HR because a lot of times once you go to HR, uh, the, the climate in your work environment changes. Because once you go to HR, they will tell your boss. But again, yeah, it's not right? in writing. It did not happen. So you want to get that writing. You want to get send email it to yourself. Because once they start finding out... <laughs> You might be surprised. You walk back in an office and you don't have no You're access to your job. <laughs> I've, always, I've always wondered about that because at the end of the day, everybody needs to know that the HR representative is not there for you. Correct. Okay. Right. That, that's, that's a front. <laughs> the Correct. HR Correct. representative is to keep that company out of HR issues. So you come into them with an HR issue. They're not on your team. They're not on your side. So I do want to make sure that we all are doing the appropriate things to document, like Attorney Redwine said, so that even when you go to EEOC, see, that's the part, I think, right, Brian and Simone? Yes. It's when you go to EEOC is when HR and the company really gets concerned because it takes, Correct. it lifts the complaint or the charges out of their company into a land of more judgment and evaluation. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, and more specifically, until, if you don't go through EEOC, first, you can't sue. EEOC has to evaluate your claim and give you what's called a right to sue letter. 
So that's why it's important to do that step first, because until that's done, lawyers like myself and like Brian Roth, we're not able to file a lawsuit on your behalf until that's done. Okay, now this is my last question, and I'm sorry, because I think this is really good. All right, now what about those sneaky companies? Because you know there are some sneaky ASS companies out here that Uh make you sign a clause before you start the job that you cannot sue them. Okay. So those, the, the closest they can come is something that says you have to arbitrate. That right. does not prevent the EEOC requirement. And secondly, all of those are not valid. Every state's different. It depends on, and, and then there are ways that we can get out of it, but lawyers are who does that for you. But even if you have that clause, you still must go to EEOC first because the law says there is no job that can make you waive your right to EEOC first. All right. I told you, algorithms. I told you, soulmates. Make sure you have that pen and paper. I told you that we were going to drop some gems. You're going to learn a couple of things. Let's give Simone Redwine some of her red wine emojis. Throw some of those briefcases in the chat for attorney Brian Ross. And don't forget to let me see all those fax emojis. That's right. F-A-X fax emojis to let us know that not only are you learning something, but you're learning something that you can use in your own life. Moving right along, everybody. Terrence Howard is coming through with his 70s fair faucet flip. Boy, is this an interesting conversation now. He's suing one of the largest talent management companies in the world who represents some of the best talent you've ever seen on television or on the basketball courts. Attorney Brian Ross, criminal defense attorney Brian Ross, is this a good idea to sue your, your agents who are representing you, and based on what he's suing them for, which is in excess of like $120 million is what he's saying he's, that he's owed, do you make the conversation, do you go to the public in public opinion looking like this yeah, I, when you're I, I, making I, an argument about something so serious that's basically race-based is what he's saying, right? Right. And he's also saying that it's been a violation of his contract and his rights. Do you bring this to the public? Do you bring this to the platform of exposing looking like this? I I would say no, but given my current hair status, if I could, I would. I don't want to make it like that, okay? But I think this like, is a wig. I think this is a wig. <laughs> well, I need to find out where he got one because I need one bad. All right. All jokes aside, I say no. I don't know what he's thinking here. Like, he's got a whole, it's permed out. Like, it's legitimately a Snoop Dogg permed out. I'm looking at it. And you're trying to sue them for, like, $100 million or something crazy, right? Like, it's a lot of money. Because Fox was making $125 million a year in ad revenue alone off of that show. And I think he was making, like, at the top $325,000 per episode. And he compared himself to his counterparts, and they were making way more than that. So I think if you want that money, you should probably drop the wig, man, and just go in a little more. <laughs> be more you know, now, Hermes tie, you know. I always teach my, I always tell my clients, if we're going to trial for money, I need you to look poor. Do not come in there looking great. Look right. poor. Well, that's what he looks. He looks like a New Orleans Creole pimp. <laughs> I mean, seven walls shorty right there. I mean, he definitely Jerome, looks poor. That's Jerome poor. off of uh, Martin Lawrence. And the wigs, the wigs, <laughs> too much, too much flavor. Too but much this flavor, is my man. question. This is my question because you know I think appearance and perception, um, unfortunately, in the in the courtroom means a lot. That's why you see, you know, that's why when you saw um, um, Megan the Stallion going to court, she wasn't showing any skin. She was dressed in suits. She had on a blouse. She doesn't dress how she normally dressed because she didn't want to give the jury any inkling that you know she's not an upstanding lady, right? because of all the information that came out during the trial. So this is my question though, uh, attorney Redwine, what would your, first of all, he's, he's fighting for equal pay, right? If I'm not mistaken, right. part of Correct. this contract fight is equal pay and equal pay. He has to have credibility around what he's saying and what he is also accusing them of. And I, so my question is when this is not your natural hair, Right now, it could be different if it was his natural hair, and we've seen it like this for a while. But if this is not your natural hair, what type of message are you sending to the jury? 
And the judge, what type of message are you sending to the jury and the judge when you go looking like a character out of, you know, Charlie Angels? Right. Now, mind you, I got six clip-in tape to the other side of this cowboy hat because I'm in between weaves, okay? My appointment is 10 a.m. tomorrow. So I'm wanting to talk, but I'm wanting to talk, okay? Because I agree. Now, I my hope is that he's here looking like this because perhaps he's also uh, talking about a role or a current project that he has upcoming. That's my hope. But I agree. Like, you don't want to look like a caricature when you want to be taken seriously because this lawsuit actually has some strong substance behind it. I right. took a look at the suit. And can I get into that a little bit, Al? Sure, go for it. Yeah. And so initially, of course, I couldn't take him seriously up here looking like a Creole pimp. Um, but when I looked <laughs> at the substance, so the gist of what he was saying is that um, the contract that he had, he started off making about 125 an episode in right. 2016. Then it doubled. And CAA was his agent. They got him up to 325. He thought that was great. But CAA also said, hey, um, we're not going to take, usually they get 10%. They said, we're not going to take our 10% because we're going to, we're pitching this as a package deal. So he thought, okay, they never made clear what they were instead doing was double dipping. Right. They were going to get paid far more than the 10% they would have got from him because they were going to get paid by also selling the actual film. So they were mm. also representing Lee Daniels and uh, the show itself. That's where they were going to make their real big money. Therefore, they had a serious conflict of interest. And mm. it was reflected in the fact. Now, when he compares the numbers, um, initially he was comparing it to shows like uh, it was. I think it was that 70s show and or Sheldon. No, 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 no. no. Uh, it was the out of the world show. I'm, I'm forgetting. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, Sheldon yes. is the offshoot. But mm -hmm. that show, he was saying they made two million per episode. But you got to compare apples to apples, apples, you know, apples to apples. And here he's doing that because um, that particular show he's referring to had only 11 million viewers a week. His 28 million. So if they were making two million. He should have been making closer to four, not wow. 325. Yes. Right, wow. not 325. So that's how he gets to the calculation that he's referencing. And what's really special about this lawsuit is what CAA did actually become became unlawful in 2020 after the writer's strike. So had that contract been entered into after the writer's strike, they wouldn't have even been able to do it because it creates the very problem he's suing about today. Wow. So this uh, is significant. So I just, okay. I uh, love this. I love the fact because I love yes. when actors should be making their money, like give them what they're worth. Correct. But I, I still, I still want to, Penny, please take the wig off. <laughs> I would hate yes, such a Please, please. don't talk about this suit no more with that thing case, on your head. Right? <laughs> I, I would hate for right. such a smaller case to be sidetracked because you know attorneys have fun when you do stuff like this oh yeah they, great time the jury, they will have the jury thinking that you came up with this conflated number because you're a weirdo and if you come right. in there dressed like a weirdo it just solidifies <laughs> that how you came up with the argument can in fact be as faulty as your look all right let's keep it moving oh, wait, Al, wait wait i know you want to move on but let me say okay. one last thing sure. viewers on our rental show don't get it mistaken this is to get attention, and that's exactly what he did. On the day when it comes time to go to court on a quote-unquote money day, there'll be no wig. There'll be a suit right. tie and a beautiful haircut. Yeah, All right. I like, I like the fact that he's trying to do this to get attention. That makes sense to me. But also, you got to think about what his reputation is. Yeah. Yeah, he's got right? His reputation is that a little bit of a, you know, different bird, like wow, yeah. like weird out. Things, you know, it's just not the best reputation. Does and he I even like black women? Because I'm not. Ooh. You know what? Let's well, move, let's move on. Let's move on. There you go. The problem is flying now. Right. Let's stop going now. Hey, sis, I had to ask it. I had to ask it. Let's move on before we get kids canceled off. So I'm just saying, like, I understand the antics and how the antics is getting coverage. 
But I also think that you got to be very careful. This is a thin, thin line mm -hmm. because people already look at his sporadic behavior and how he, you know, up and down and all around. It's questionable anyway. Thank you, Attorney Redwine, for giving us all that clarity. And that's the reason why Absolutely. I wanted to create this show to teach our listeners and our viewers exactly their rights. All right, let's go to this very, very sad story that is really very upsetting to me. Sunken place prosecutor threatens custody of mother's child because a cop shot her 11-year-old son. Now, before I pass this over to criminal defense attorney Brian Ross, let's just give you a little bit of the details. They're saying that this was a domestic violence call and that the domestic violence in the house has been going on for years. And that she's an unfit mother for putting her kids in this environment. In fact, after the kid was shot, it was the kid himself that called 911. Attorney Ross, please tell us, how is it that we are worried about whether the mother had an unfit home environment over the fact that a cop that was called to break up a domestic violence dispute shot an 11-year-old 11 11-year-old 11 child? Apparently, the boyfriend of the mother, Nicola Murray, and you know, this child's mother had a history of domestic violence related incidents. Okay. A history of them. She has three children, including a Darian Murray, who was shot by Sergeant Capers in Mississippi. So the father of one of the children shows up at the house at four o'clock in the morning, causing a problem. She tells one of her children, call the police. When the police show up, the father is now gone. So now the unrest is allegedly settled. However, Sergeant Capers says, everyone in the house, come outside with your hands up. Well, poor little 11-year-old Darian Murray comes running around the corner, opens the door, and Sergeant Capers unloads and shoots him. Collapses his lung, causes his liver to bleed, and while the boy is laying on the ground, he dials 911 himself, which is insane, and while he's there, he starts screaming, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I've never seen anything like this before in my life. In return, though he did live, the mother sues the, the police officers for $5 million. I believe that some of this is in response to that lawsuit. Uh, they want to categorize yeah. her as Hell an unfit yes. mother to try to make it seem as though it's her fault that her child wasn't more prepared for a police officer to show up at five o'clock in the morning. And that this is the basis of this claim. This seems like, this seems like retaliation of some sorts to me. Absolutely. I mean, it just seems like because she has, and first of all, she needs more than $5 million. <laughs> yeah, she needs more than $5 million. She definitely. needs more than five million dollars. I don't know who her yeah. lawyer is, but it's definitely not Red Wine or Ross. She <laughs> needs more than five million dollars. Um, yeah. I I just don't get this. I don't get this. And why in the why in the world would would child protective services come in and want to take her child from that mother after this traumatic incident? And, you have the, to understand. and are, go ahead, sorry. CPS works hand in hand with the police, right? The police okay. give them their instructions mm. many times. So it's very difficult to, for them to go against what the police says because they're really required to work hand in hand. Mm. They essentially so, are cops if you think about it. Mm -hmm. well, the, I See, that, that, even, that even confuses me even more because think about what you're saying, right? Think about what you're saying. There is no accountability. This cop could possibly get out of of accountability for shooting a little kid that ran out the house like you said do it just because they didn't move slowly you decided to unleash on an on an 11 year old a kid the kid can't be more than five feet tall at 11. one of the ways that we can force accountability is we have to start filing more complaints we have to file them against these officers and then we need to share them and there's these mofos put it on facebook share it on youtube because if it Imagine if there was a Facebook group that was just complaints against cops, right? And you could search by names. Then we would start realizing, oh, wait, he shot my brother uh, two years ago. He yes. shot my cousin. He ran up and, and pulled all of my kids out of the car and had them lay down on the, on the ground. 
I come to realize that a lot of these things, we don't know about it because you think it's just you. And then they, they humiliate you and they embarrass you. But mm. both complaints against both the officers and CPS workers need to be made because the CPS workers are state licensed and they are at risk of losing their license for doing stuff like this. So that they got to know, hey, we're going to file complaints against you and you are going to have to be, you're going to have to talk to the public. Or you're going to have to talk to the state licensing committee, but no more are we suffering in silence. I like that concept. So when you say complain, do we? Who do we complain to? Do we? So complain? usually, every um, every police department, if you go to their website, there's a, a tab for complaints. You can also do a uh, complain to the U.S. Department of Justice because they actually oversee issues of, of civil rights pertaining to any local police department, but start with your local police department. You can usually do it online. You always want to do it online. That way you have, um, uh, it's going to email to you proof that you've done mm. it, plus you can do a screenshot. And I say, do it that way. You don't have to leave your house. You start there. <laughs> yeah. Don't leave your house. Don't, don't leave your house. <laughs> don't leave your house. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, also, you can go down there and do a complaint down there and they try to Say, oh, your tags are bad. We're going to arrest you because exactly, they're mad exactly. and you're building it. So it's, I'm, I'm, right. I'm making all these complaints warrant. from my living room. If you have any outstanding warrants. So uh, Thimes 308 said, Al, parents need to protect children after being exposed to repeated emotional trauma. I agree with you, Thimes 308, but that's not what I'm upset about. What I'm upset about is that this police station has navigated this story to be a story about an unfit mother and not a police officer who has taken an oath to protect and serve and didn't protect this 11 year old boy who ran out of this house. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that she doesn't deserve to be um, investigated, but I will say that I would prefer that they handle that officer before or in conjunction with why they handle her. All right, before we go to the questions from our jury, which will be our viewers, we're going to do a did he do it update. All right, uh, uh, Simone Redwine, who I know is our Diddy correspondent, after five sexual assault allegations, multiple brands and businesses have decided to distance themselves. We know that Revolt has. We know that 18 companies in Empower Global has. Hulu, reality, Hulu and the reality television show has decided to bring it all to end. But also his management company that manages him as a talent manager to decided to drop him as a client. And that's South Co. Capital Prep Harlem has decided to separate themselves. And also there's a new amended complaint where Little Rod accuses Diddy of involvement in the alleged studio shooting. Boy, when it rains, it pours over there in the Diddy legal house. Attorney Redwine, can you bring us up to date on this new amendment and all these people that are distancing themselves from Diddy? I think you did an excellent summary. I think the only one that was left off was Christian Combs is now being sued. Both Christian and Diddy are being sued by a woman who worked on a yacht that they'd rented. Um, she's claiming that he made unwanted advances at her, that she received um, bruises on her arms, etc. And she's also being represented by the same attorney as Little Rod, which is Blackburn, Tyrone Blackburn. Oh, and another interesting thing is I said from the beginning, I said, I really did not like the fact that I felt like Mr. Blackburn's complaint, the way that he's drafted each and every one of them was that it was very set, very much set to embarrass the other celebrities that were named that weren't necessarily sued, that it was um, it, it felt like blackmail. Well, a judge has recently reprimanded Tyrone Blackburn, Little Rod's attorney, and even referred him to the disciplinary committee of the bar. Specifically, the judge said exactly what I thought. He recently, just last week, he stated that the way in which um, Mr. Blackburn has drafted his petitions is as though it is to um, it is to attack, embarrass, and then guilt or not guilt, but um, to Public push these guilt. people into, yeah. push these people into a corner and force them to pay him off to prevent the embarrassment. And that is not what these courts are for. These courts are for cases that have validity to be held in front of juries so that juries can do it based on the evidence, not based on you simply trying to embarrass people who've done nothing wrong. <laughs> Fuji TV said the judge got paid off. Sounds like a little bit of that to me. Too. <laughs> let me tell you something, Fuji. I think you might be onto something. And let me share with you my perspective here. So I, I feel like that if they hadn't sensationalized all this, 
all these other people who were violated, all these celebrities that have all these stories all of a sudden wouldn't have come forward. Absolutely. I think that this attorney was very clever, very clever of setting the stage to let other famous people come forward with their stories to give his claim validity to let other women who were sexually assaulted create a safe environment. You know, I say this all the time on my other show and on here. We have got to get to a space where we create a safe environment for people that are sexually assaulted, raped, or done wrong. Come forward quicker. And That's I something. think what this attorney has crafted so cleverly is that environment. He's created an environment that celebrities who normally would never speak out against Diddy are now comfortable coming forward with their stories of being uncomfortable. We are now seeing videos of people like uh, Mike Tyson, who sat beside Diddy during an interview, moving his hand. Like, I think that if it wasn't for this lawyer's aggressiveness in creating this narrative, these people simply would not feel comfortable coming forward to prove that he is possibly capable of doing what the complaint alleged. So for me, I, I kind of feel like maybe the judge, well, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. So attorney Brian Ross, what do you think? I, I think it's absolutely correct that this complaint he filed let off a series of events that led to this open environment. You would never come out against Diddy. You would exactly. never say anything about Diddy. You would have never said anything about Harvey Weinstein. You know what it took for those women to say something about Harvey Weinstein? Their careers would have been over. It took a huge, powerful, massive movement to have this happen. And that's what you see happening to Diddy right now. That's no, I, and, and I just want to clarify. I agree. I have no problem with naming the names of the defendants. What makes me uncomfortable is when you're naming names of people that you're not listing as defendants, because right. that's when it mm. looks like it's just to embarrass and humiliate, because you can say a model, you can, you know, you can use other, a rapper, you can use other terms that don't say Daphne Joy, that don't say, right. Kamisha, or that don't say Carisha, if you're not going to list her as a defendant. That's my now, Isn't in the complaint, he's just explaining the scenarios of who was in attendance in the complaint. He's not really charging them of anything. I think it was those sharing of those names that once again created the environment. But you're right. We can go he's back and forth. He's accusing them of being sex workers. Whoa. So that's accusing them of something that you're not suing on. It's But it's okay. still part of his scathing effort to try to draw all this public opinion. Right. Out. You're yeah, right. and that, I think I think it's the brilliance behind it. That's the brilliant, I agree. Nuggets, right there on the paper, right in Diddy's face. And right. who and Diddy's like, who are you to do this to me? I'm the king of New York. And Where also, I think I think you don't know to what extent that those names who were in attendance could possibly be on some type of video camera doing something that could be suspect. So I like the fact that he was he was like very clever in creating this environment of fear amongst those who probably were participating in some way or not. All right, let's keep it moving because I want to make sure that I get to our uh, viewers questions. I have a few here. And remember, viewers, we are going to make you as the show starts to evolve. You're going to be our jury members. And jury members will have a right to, to, to give a poll to give their opinion on guilty or not guilty when we get to the part of the show where we give our rulings out here in the court of public opinion. So the first question is from Quita G. Isn't he a first offender? I think she's a, talking to Jonathan Majors. Majors is he correct. a first time correct. offender is what I'm assuming that question's about. Mm -hmm. Who would like to take that question? I'll take it. Yes, he is a first time offender. Um, and that factors into any sanction, whether it's jail or probation, you're going to get. The fact that he doesn't have a history of convictions, not just arrest convictions for this, was a big part of what the judge looked at. You want to get, believe it or not, as cynical as our country is when it comes to criminal justice, the system is designed to give first-time offenders a second chance. We're all human. We all make mistakes. He was found guilty of it. That's on the record. He says he didn't do it, but in our country, guilt is admission. He's guilty of it. Let's give him a second chance and see how he does. That's a point of probation. We'll see where it goes, though. Got it. All right. Next question is from Judy. Judy, I'm not going to even try to pronounce your last name, but it's K-R-Z-Y-W-O-N-O-S. I'm going to say Kritzwanos. <laughs> question. Don't hold Why is Diddy still walking around free? Brian? 
because he has not been charged of with a crime. If he has been charged with a crime, he probably would have to post a bond or stay in jail awaiting trial. In this instance, everything against him is either civil, where they want money and no jail, or alleged. But just wait. Just so wait. this is my question. They're still also, going through the evidence. They just yeah, picked up all right. the evidence. They still also, looking through it. Also, also, because this kind of feels like behind the scenes negotiation is going on, because he could have also said, "Listen, let's figure out how we can settle this," because I, I'm just being killed. In public, in public opinion, could that be possibly the lawyers trying to figure out if they need to go further with the charges or not? Defense attorney, criminal attorney, Brian Ross. I, I think there's a lot of back and forth negotiations going on between his attorneys with the U.S. Attorney's Office, with the FBI, potentially with any local authorities, their interests, as well as on the civil side. Any settlement that happens and Simone back me up that happens for any of these people, Rodney Jones or whoever may be suing him, will involve an off-the-record, unwritten understanding that they're going to disappear as witnesses, that they're mm. not going to cooperate. Now, you can't make them sign that away, but trust and believe that conversation is going to happen in its own ethical way where you say, okay, we're going to give you a bag. Here's $20 million. We don't want to see you in federal court testifying against my guy, though. And there's a way where you can make that happen. You Got know, it. But that. they didn't do that with Cassie because we know that Cassie is actually cooperating with the feds. And, right? and, and the charge. So the charges, the way Cassie's complaint was written, they're not allowed to do so under the law. Both California and New York both have laws that basically say if you are accusing a person of a felony or as assault, then um, even if the settlement agreement says that there's a, a non-disclosure, you can't talk about it, et cetera, that provision is invalid. So that is in part why Cassie was able to talk. And, and mm. truly, any provision that says you can't speak to the police is invalid. Even if it's there, it doesn't hold up in court. But what it. happens is they generally try and scare you into saying you can't speak to the police first. Now, if they reach out to you, you need to tell us first. All of that is Fuji. It's fudge. It's not valid. They will put it in there, but it isn't valid. So but let's that, talk about, I'm sorry, go ahead, Brian. If that person goes to court and believe us, me people, if they tell you, let's, let's put it in the context of something that people do all the time, a domestic violence situation. You and your baby mama had too much to drink and now you got a problem. She decides, I don't want to testify against my baby daddy. I love him again. He bought me a new Lexus. Okay, fine. <laughs> right? You got to knock off Airman Birkin bag. Whatever works for you. Right. And you decide, I'm not going to go to court. They can send a police officer to your house, arrest you, and put you in jail, and bring you to the stand and make you testify. However, when you get on the stand, if you say, I don't remember what happened. That's I have I no mean. recollection. I don't recall that photo. What is that called again? Perjury. Perjury. That's right. That's Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you something, because this is a this is the thing that I've saw a lot of chatter online. Everyone's saying, well, didn't Rodney Jones sign an NDA? Didn't Rodney Jones sign an NDA? And so what I keep telling people, and I want the attorneys to tell me if I'm right, is that NDAs, think of NDAs, even though it is a document that you sign. It's more of a scare tactic. Mm. It's not right. binded, right, bound or bind. What is it? Bind by the binding. law. Binding. Binding. Uh -huh. So can we talk about that? Because a lot of people are saying, you know, he signed an NDA. How is he allowed to talk? He's allowed to talk because NDAs do not protect unlawful activities. They do not uh, protect against crimes. You are always allowed to speak of a crime and you are always allowed to speak of unlawful activities. Because think of it. Most jobs make you sign an NDA. Does that mean they can then fire you for doing something racist? No, because that is unlawful. So that's an example mm. of how NDAs still allow you to go to an attorney, tell the attorney what's happened to you, and that attorney can determine if any of those things are law violations and help you file a civil complaint. Attorney uh, Brian Ross, this is my question. Kevin Hart is dealing with an NDA violation with his old assistant who's saying that she overheard 
his conversation with his wife about his indiscretion. Now, he is suing the assistant for violation of her NDA because she went on Tasha K and talked about shared all his business. Does that NDA stand up in the court of law? It probably will. I haven't examined it. But in that instance, you're talking about a civil matter. If the assistant had heard him talking to his wife about how he killed his nephew and she went and said, I overheard him say he killed his nephew, he couldn't go to court and say, well, she signed a non-disclosure agreement, so she can't talk about the fact that I killed my nephew because ah. that's the way that would work. So in that instance, it might hold up because it's a civil matter. You agree? All right, got it. So anything legal, anything legal, the NDA is probably a little bit watery, right? Anything let, let me clarify. When okay. Brian says it's a civil matter, that's a personal matter. Him cheating on his wife doesn't break a law, doesn't break a rule. It's not part of, you know, an employment law violation. So that's why uh, she can't just decide, oh, if I hear he does something wrong to his wife, I get to tell her and violate. OK, so even if she has a prenup that says any indiscretions or known indiscretions will terminate, could terminate their prenup agreement, can she still yep, not? Because it's not, it's, it's not a rule. Yeah, it's not a law. Yeah, it's not a law. Okay. All right. Let's keep moving. I love this. I, you know, I could ask these questions all day. All right. Next question is, oh, this is a good one from Jim. G.E.M. Drop says, does what Terrence Howard talked about impact Taraji as well? Wow. A great question. It could if she wants to join into the lawsuit. Absolutely, it would. She could join in and they both win. Because okay, got it. All right. No justice wants some advice from attorney Ross. What are your thoughts on constitutional violations? I think they're terrible. No, what I'll jump. God, I need an example. I think, I, 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 I think that's in general speaking, a okay. constitutional violation is very hard to prove. You have to notify the government that you're going to try and go after it, and you have to do all these hurdles to try and get through them. So, this little boy, Adarian Murray, is alleging that his civil rights were violated for being shot. That's what he's alleging. I have a right to be in my home, walk out with my hands up, and not get shot. That's the basis of the lawsuit. But the problem is the police officer goes in front of a grand jury to find out if the behavior was criminal and the grand jury didn't indict him because they have qualified immunity. They don't get they don't get charged with certain things. So you're alleging a constitutional violation. Your case has to be pretty airtight. And you really have to know what you're doing. Mm, OK, I like it. All right. Last question from our algorithms and soulmates is Derek Rivera. I hope I said that right. Is Jonathan Majors and Megan Good relationship PR to get in good graces with the black community and sway the court of public opinion? This is a good question, Derek. Mm, that's a red wine question, if you ask me. A, a lot of people think that it is. I think, but from what I understand about Megan, is she loves love. She really wants to be in love. She wants to be in an adoring relationship. So I believe for Jonathan's side, she is a great PR thing, but I think on her side, I think she sincerely likes him. So, I mean, I hope he's also being sincere with her too. Um, and before I go, I want to give a shout out to Quilla G who uh, gave me a super chat. I think it's one of my first super chats on the channel. Ah, Thank you so much. And she ah. stated that Tyrone Blackburn is an inexperienced lawyer looking for clout. These were, there were other ways he could have approached it. Well, thank you for your thoughts and thanks for tuning in. <laughs> so I'm going to call baloney when I hear baloney. I, you know, <laughs> the, issue, the issue that I have with, uh, with uh, Jonathan Majors and Megan Good is this. We've never seen him in the life of being in entertainment on a carpet with a black woman. Never. Well, that's never true. Seen, never seen him on a carpet. And with a black he's from my neighborhood, Duncanville High School. I'm just it was saying, very black, I, I, so I'm there is no giving, excuse. I'm giving my personal opinion here, and this is how I feel. Not saying that this isn't real love, but how is it all of a sudden that you're being charged with assault from a white woman? Your history of dating history has been all white women. The women who came against you, in addition to just this white woman that charged you, that, that went to the attorney general's office, were once again all white women. And in addition to all that, you do have a child. We don't know the uh, we don't know the ethnicity of the child. Uh, we know the name of the mother is like Helen Ann. 
So mm. once again, my <laughs> issue here is the optics of now that you're in trouble with the other side, you go get one of the ones that we love, that we follow, that we trust, that we, that we, you know, it's one of our best black female talents in our time right now, not saying of all time, but in our time right now, she doesn't have that much, you know, bad media around her. You know, we believe her. She's beautiful. And so to me, it does feel kind of PR-ish. And the way that she's showing up in court. And another thing, this is just my opinion. And I'm not saying that this could not be real love because it could be. I'm just saying optically. I have never seen Jonathan Majors on a black carpet. And y'all know I <laughs> come from a red carpet. I have yeah. never seen this man on a black carpet. I have never seen Jonathan Majors at the image at the NAACP Image Awards. Baby, I have seen him on Essence Music Fest. I have seen him <laughs> at, uh, at every single panel of, of BET or something. I've seen him at the NAACP Image Awards. Okay, what? I'm it's thinking. obvious. It's obvious. So I mean, for it's me, obvious. it's not for me. It's not that it's not real, but I can see how there is a question mark there. Do you think she knows though? Do you think she's playing into this, or do that she could be a victim? She seems like a very, I don't know. We don't, you don't know any of these people, right? Right. She seems like a very nice person. I don't right. know. I mean, Al's certainly closer to her than I have ever been. Right. But I'm, she seems like a good, like, you don't see her out there with these scandals. You don't see okay. her in a Kardashian Ray J video. You don't see any of that. She just yeah. does her job. Yeah. And she's so been hanging out with this guy going to court with him. She didn't have to go to court with him. It's well, this is a deal. One thing that I do know about Megan and her sister, those are some of the two of the hardest working sisters in Hollywood. And they are very aware of everything that happens and that's related to their image and to how to navigate Hollywood. Those two women are just, just probably some of the best at it as being aware. Right. So I, Simone, to answer your question, I don't think that she's being taken advantage of at all. I think she's okay. making very sound decisions that that is could be coordinated. Um, and maybe she does like him. Maybe she does like him. But I don't think that she could ever agree to him calling her Coretta Scott King. <laughs> now, I don't think she would ever coach him through saying any of that crazy stuff that he says. And to me, that's where the disconnect is because anybody that comes out of her or her sister's or family's camp, they just not moving like that in these streets and definitely not these Hollywood streets. All right, everybody, we have done it again. It's time for the rulings in the court of public opinion. And we're going to start first up. Who was our first person that we spoke about tonight? Jonathan Majors gets one year. All right. Attorney uh, Redwine, Attorney Ross, would you have taken jail time or probation? Probation. Probation. Ross. Put me in jail, man. I can't use 52 weeks of this. I everybody, it seems all nice today. But 4th of July is right around the corner. I'm trying to go to Rikers my Island. auntie's barbecue. Right. I'll be all right. Give me some books. Give me some books. So I'm the judge and I'm confused. I'm a little bit leaning one way or another, but Red Wine made a strong case. How do you deal with the public relations of that being seen on Rikers Island or going to jail? But on the flip side, Attorney Brian Ross, you made some very clear arguments that, hey, he could put expose himself in that year of probation that really could cause him contracts or even more headache than necessary. So with that, I am going to rule. I'm going to prove Jail time. Jail time for Jonathan Majors was the best decision for him. All right, let's go to Young Miami. Young Miami got served at a Houston pool party. So do you think that uh, Charles Kenyatta has a case here? Attorney Redwine, are we, are we saying do. that he it, does have a case or don't have a case? I think he has a case. He has a case. So he has the right to sue Young Miami for using, promoting, selling, and wearing his stuff. All right, which is yep. what is act bad. All right, Red uh, Attorney Ross, what are your thoughts? Is she guilty or not guilty of infringement? She's guilty of infringement. There's too much going on in that little camp right now. <laughs> I, I just don't like it. She took the man's trademark, knew he was going to jail, and said, What's he gonna do about it? So yeah, like he just needs to get a lawyer. 
Uh, Mr. Kenyatta, you got to get you a good lawyer, honey. Good good lawyer. Lawyer. All right. In the court of public opinion, we're finding young Miami guilty. Guilty of charge of infringement. Let's keep it going. The baby. The baby is saying, no brazen my penis. He said, that's sexual assault. Attorney <laughs> Redwine, is this sexual assault a case that he actually could win if he wanted to file it? Is he guilty yes. or not guilty? Yes. So he, you said, yeah, he can win it. He can, he win, can it. win it. Attorney Ross, can he win this brazen of the penis by one of his fans? I mean, you got to show she intended to do it. And so I don't think he can win it because you hopped on a private plane and went and did more shows after that. I think he just takes a loss on this one. <laughs> All right, for the for the baby, I'm going to say, uh, nope, he can't win this one. I don't think that the woman was very intentional. I would have need to see not just a glaze or a braise. I need to see a growth or a touch in the court of public affairs. They're going to throw me out the courthouse. All right, Terrence Howard. Terrence Howard, does Terrence Howard have a right to sue, regardless of what his hair looks like, a 70s flip? Does he have a right to sue based on the information that we've received to get that hundred and some plus million dollars that he's owed? Attorney Bross, what are your thoughts? He has a right to sue. If the person who's across the aisle from me doesn't look like me and they make it 10 times me and my show is better than theirs, the facts speak for himself. Legal term right. of the day, raise ipsa loquitur. All right, so to my attorney, uh, Redwine, what are your thoughts? Sue and take that wig off. <laughs> I agree. I'm gonna say rule in the in favor of how Terrence Howard and please take that wig off so that you don't confuse people. All right, I'm with you. All right, last one. Sunken place prosecutor is trying to blame the mother for unfit parenthood instead of focusing on the cop that shot him. What say you, red wine? Is this good or bad? Can I fight her? I just want to <laughs> fight her. It's terrible. All right, so, so you say terrible. no, the prosecutor is focusing on the wrong things. All right, uh, criminal defense attorney Brian Ross, is the prosecutor focusing on the wrong thing, or should he be worried about a cop who's using excessive force and shooting 11 year olds? I'm going to agree with Red Wine. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. I mean, how can you do this to this little boy and let you shot an 11 year old kid who was coming out the front door? Give the man something. Exactly. I'm going to say, uh, the sunken place prosecutor. You are a bad person for not <laughs> making sure to protect the citizen, the little boys of your community. I am going to rule in favor of the mother in this case. Let's do both congruently, but at the first thing off the bat, you should be focusing on that child and that child's life. All right, everybody, algorithms and soulmates, that brings another edition of our In Court Opinion to a close. Hope you enjoyed it. Please drop some uh, wine glasses in the emojis in the chat. Please drop those briefcase for the criminal defense attorney, Brian Ross, and a couple of fax emojis if you enjoyed this evening. All right, everybody, have a good night, and we'll see you tomorrow sharply at 6.30 p.m. specific and 9.30 p.m. Eastern. Have a good night.